father beside you, a happy Father's Day with an elbow. Hallelujah. A glorious, glorious Father's Day. But we want to talk about the greatest father of all. Amen. Who so recklessly loves us. To the extent that he will pursue us wherever we are. And make sure that he grabs us. Amen. Amen. spoken word you were seeking over me and you've been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathe your life in me and you've been so so kind to me and oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God oh it chases me down I still am found leaves the ninety nine I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you gave yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God Yes, you love us, God Yeah Your love so Your fault, still your love for me. Hey, you've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all, you paid it all for me. You've been so, so
this morning. Put your hands together for them. Were you following the lyrics? Were you following the words of the song? Beautiful, beautiful song. 
Amen. God bless you. Reckless love. That is the love of the Father. He'll do anything and everything just to make sure he gets you. He'll kick down mountains, tear down lights. The Father himself loves you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our precious Father, thank you for this reckless love, Lord, by which you love us to the extent that you sent your Son, your only begotten Son, into this world to save us. Even when we were your foes, your enemies, you loved us so much that Christ died for us. We thank you, Father of all fathers, for such wonderful, reckless love that comes after us. We bless you with all our hearts for your goodness. Our minds cannot comprehend the depth of your love, the width of your love, how high your love is. But all we know that we are living testimonies of what your love can do to us. We bless you, eternal Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Shall we all say amen? amen. Oh, I said amen. amen. In fact, um, when they were singing, I didn't have, a scripture just came to my mind. I just want to read a scripture quickly. Can we get the fan off? Can we put the fan off? Quickly, I just want to read a scripture. When they were singing the song, my mind just quickly took me to... Isaiah chapter 63, I want to read some scriptures from Isaiah chapter 63. Who is he, who is this coming from Edom, from Bozra, with his garments stained crimson? Who is this, robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Then we quickly go on to verse number 7. I will tell of the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised. According to all the Lord has done for us, yes, the many good things he has done for the house of Israel. According to his compassion and many kindness. He says, surely they are my people, sons who will not be false to me. And so he became their savior in all their distress. He too was distressed, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Amen. I don't know if you have seen the picture this morning, but God is telling us about his infinite love that he has for Israel, and I want to say he has for the redeemed, the church of the living God. He carries us. He makes sure that we get to the other side. Hallelujah. Oh, I said hallelujah. Good morning and happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house. Oh, give it up for the fathers. All right. And to all the potential fathers in the house too. Ladies, you can do it better. Give it up for them. Since I arrived into, in this house, I've seen some good fathers in this house. Yes, I've seen some good fathers in this house. Keep on clapping for them. Keep on clapping for them. Hallelujah. And we pray that by the grace of God, we'll raise more fathers who will stand in that generation and conduct their houses in the fear of God. Hallelujah. I see more fathers coming down the line. We thank God for his mercies. Amen. I think a lot of people have the notion that fathers are not good, but that is not a good notion. There are good fathers around. Oh, there are good fathers around. The amen is weak. Hallelujah. We want to thank God for his mercies. So happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house. We quickly want to go on to what we want to talk about today. For the past few weeks, we've been speaking to the, t uh, to the topic, the father's love. Today, we want to shift a little bit. We want to go on to... We want to speak about giving, and the title of my topic is, or the topic is, what do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand? What do you have in your hand? Before that, I want to read something that somebody sent to me and uh, to the fathers in the house. What makes you a father is not the ability to have a child, it's the courage to raise one. A father doesn't tell you 
A father doesn't tell you what he doesn't tell you that he loves you. He shows you that he loves you. Oh, I thought you you say an amen. Anyone, anyone who does anything to help a child is in his life is a hero. One father is more than a thousand schoolmasters. Happy Father's Day. One father is more than a thousand schoolmasters. Remember Paul told them that, look, you've had a lot of instructors in Christ. But in Christ, I bethed you, or I'm your father. And that one, you cannot take it away from me. Amen. We thank God for spiritual fathers. We thank God for grandfathers. We thank God for fathers. Amen. So let's go to our topic. What do you have in your hand? On the 27th, God willing, we'll be raising an offering here to help with our building. And I want to give you insights into giving and giving the biblical way. There's a lot going on in the church where people are being coerced to give, forced to give, and light on to give. And that is not a good way to give. Giving is a beautiful thing. The Bible talks about giving. The Bible teaches about giving. But it has to be done the Bible way. If you believe it, say amen. amen. The first thing you need to know when you are always giving to God or giving to the people of God is that you are owned by God. And everything that you owe is for God. This single truth, when it hits you very hard, puts you in a position where you are able to freely give. Oftentimes when a man thinks that all that I've acquired is by my own strength and by my own grace, he loses that point. But that truth, if it comes through you, that it is God who has given to you and that you, you as a person are owned by God and everything that you have also belongs to God, it makes it easier for you to give. Can I hear an amen? The second thing is that your giving is another way of saying thank you to God and of also expressing your faith in God. Giving helps you to express your faith in God and to say thank you to God. One of the things that Jesus taught us in the scriptures is to learn to be grateful or to say thank you when somebody does something for you. And anytime we give to the poor, we give to the needy, we give for the work of God, we, need for, we give for the cause of Christ, all that we are saying to God is that we are thankful for the things you've done for us. We are grateful for the things you've done for us. Can I hear an amen? Now, giving the Bible way should always be your focus. I want to repeat. Giving the Bible way should always be your focus. There are people who have given and for one reason or the other have not experienced anything, any joy. They give and they actually regret after giving. There's a joy that comes when you give biblically and we give with understanding. And you make giving a way of life and part of your life. And it is my prayer that by the end of this message, you will learn these principles. I'm going to teach two of them. You learn these principles and you, you, you imbibe them into your life, in your life journey whilst you're on earth. One of the things we need to do, and for parents who are in the house, I will encourage you. Learn to teach your child to be a giver. Don't brush it off and think that automatically they will know how to give. No. And that is why in our fundraising last week, we decided and deliberately penned out and said that our children are going to be part of this fundraising. We are going to help them to know that it is good to give for the cause of Christ and also for humanity. Hallelujah. You need to take pains in life to instruct people to learn to be givers. And that is what I intend to do this morning. The Apostle Paul, who was the Apostle designated for the Gentiles, also taught the churches that he pastored, or he, he served as an Apostle, that they need to learn how to give. By extension this morning, I want to teach this church, and I know this church knows how to give, but we want to go deeper as a church and be a giving church in every aspect of our giving lives. Amen. Quickly open your scriptures to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 1. We read number 1 and number 2. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. I read. 
Now about the collection for the Lord or about the offering for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. I want to take it again. Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. Verse number two. On the first day of every week, on the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up. That when I come, no collection will have to be made. Can I hear an amen? The apostle was teaching the Corinthians how to save regularly. And he said, or he put it this way, that every week, the first day of every week, put some sum of money aside in keeping with what God has blessed you with. Immediately you see a principle of voluntary giving. You giving according to how God has blessed you. When people rise up and say, come and give because you have a car, come and give. Sometimes it's a little bit funny. But you give according to just how the Lord has blessed you. Paul says that set some money aside every week. So that when he comes, he collect that money and he will send it to the churches in Jerusalem. Now, the people of God in Jerusalem were in need. And the churches, the Gentile churches wanted to bless them. And he was teaching the churches how they need to go about raising their funds, raising their offering to bless the people of God. A deliberate act, prayerfully considered, you set something aside. You don't do it spontaneously. You don't just do it because you want to do it, but you do it because you've thought through it and you really want to bless the people of God. If you are not in that habit, I will encourage you that week by week, month by month, or as the Lord blesses you, set some money aside and use it to bless the people of God. You can use it to bless poor people. You can use it to bless the needy. You can use it to bless the church of God. For example, we are having a project. You can decide, I'm going to use this money to help this project. And you do it prayerfully and you do it deliberately. If you've not been doing it, it's a life principle that I want to teach you. I've not talked about any amount now, but all that I'm teaching you is the principle of you regularly setting something aside to be a blessing to other people. Can I hear an Amen. So the principle is this. He says that I taught the churches in Galatia to do this. And I'm also teaching the church in um, Corinth to also do it. And I believe that he's also teaching us to do it as a church, corporately and also as individuals. I remember way back in my former station, we were building just a small group of people as a church, corporately. But the Lord laid upon my hand, so I communicated it to the church. I said, listen, we, we are having our challenges as a church, raising money to build, but we are doing our best. But out of this, I want us to set out a particular Sunday, raise funds, and then we will also go into the interland. We know there are other churches who are also even more deprived than we are. So even though we were struggling, in fact, at that time, when it rains, sometimes the rain beats us in church. But I told them that as a principle of giving, let us set a Sunday aside. And the church bought into that idea. So there were times that we would put a bowl and we would raise good money. And then we look out for churches, I mean apostolic churches in the rural areas. And then we'll send somebody with that money and go and bless them. And I remember a couple of times when the money went, the offering went, the people were like, we we've never heard of this before. I mean... We don't know you. We've not even come to ask you for anything. What on earth and why would you, why would you raise money to come and help us? Because actually they were in need. So we look for good churches and then we bless them. I pray that this church will learn this principle. You give not because you just have abundance, but you give because it is a principle of life. Can I hear an amen? amen. Learn to be a giver. Somebody has said that givers no, don't lack. Learn to be a giver. There are people who say, oh, I don't, have, I don't have, so I won't give. You are losing out on the blessing that comes with giving. 
So the first principle I'm teaching this morning is that give regularly. Give regularly. As often as God blesses you with income, he would ask you to set aside a share for him, for his work, and for God's people. Can I hear an amen? And make it your life, make it a part of your life. Don't just be a one-time giver. Make it every day. As the Lord blesses you, find, find people that you can be a blessing to them. In fact, when the Bible talked about the blessing that came upon Abraham, do you know how the Lord put it? He says that I will bless you. And oftentimes we stop at that. But what he continued is that I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to others. The reason why God blesses you is that you have to be a blessing to other people. And anytime you put yourself into a, a position where you are ready to be a blessing, an extension of God's love to other people, especially those who are in need and for the work of God, God sees you as a good steward and God will continue to open doors unto you. Can I hear an amen? Now, when Paul was teaching the churches to give, I'm sure he might have learned it from somewhere. Let's quickly go on to Acts chapter 2. Sorry, Acts chapter 20, verse number 35. Paul was an apostle, but Paul was a tent maker. He was working. People call it the tent ministry. And when he worked with his hands and God blessed him, he sold his tent and he built his tent, out of that he used the money to bless people. And in Acts chapter 20 verse number 35, he taught the church that principle. And I want us to go into the Bible and read it. Acts 20, 35. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. And then he goes on to say something which is very important. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So this great apostle understood that Jesus himself taught his disciples to, to be givers. Because it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, you will say, ah, but it doesn't make sense. If you give me, it is a blessing. But if I give you, it is more of a blessing, or it is a better blessing. How does it work? Let me give you an example. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, he had a begotten son, and he gave out his begotten son. And because God gave out his begotten son, today, by the grace and the mercies of God, millions and millions of people have come into a relationship with the Father, and they are also called sons of God. And it was because he gave. Anytime you give, you make room for more to come. If I'm holding something like this in my hand, all right, whatever it may be, maybe let's say a pebble, and I hold on to it, and I don't open my arm, if I open my arm, then I can give it out. So that thing leaves my arm or my hand. Immediately it leaves, it means my hands are open. And once my hands are open, there is a tendency that if somebody is given, I can also what? Receive. But once my hands are fixed like this, my fists are just clinked together like this, I can receive. It becomes difficult to receive. So God's principle, you know, man's principle is that hold it and then you get more. That's man's principle. But God's principle is that give because there's more blessing in giving than in receiving. And I want to say this with emphasis underlined. 
the sum of the givings that we are given here on earth has eternal value. I want to say it again. Some of the givings that you are given here on earth carries eternal value. And almighty faithful God will definitely reward you. So don't be tired of giving and make it your lifestyle. Learn to be a giver. Can I hear an amen? amen? I want to push the second principle this morning. And to buttress this scripture, we can read also from Proverbs chapter 11, verse number 24 and 25. I'm reading from the Amplified Version this morning. A man may give freely and still his wealth will be increased. And another may keep back more than is right, but only comes to be in need. Verse number 25. The generous man is a source of blessing and shall be prosperous and enriched. And he who waters will himself be watered, that is, reaping the generosity, the generosity he has sown. So God says that the liberal soul will also be watered himself. He said that he that gives will also be given. The last time I taught you this principle, that the reason why we give is because of the love for the Father. Make it your alpha reason for giving to the people of God. Can I hear an Amen. But the principle stands, when you learn to be a giver, when you learn to have a liberal soul to, to give, God will have a way of blessing you also. In Jesus' name, amen. The second principle I want to talk about this morning before we close the service is the giving of the first fruit. Let's quickly go to Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 9. Proverbs 3, number 9. Giving of the first fruit. That is, we are to thank him from the first and best of all our income and our possession. All right. In the book of Genesis, something happened. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 4, we are not going to read that one, but in Genesis chapter 4, Two brothers came to the Lord to offer unto the Lord. And I know you know the story. Unfortunately, eventually it didn't end well. Because one brother rose up and killed the other. But I want us to look at the first part of the story. One was a shepherd. The other one tilled the ground. He grew crops. Now, it got to a time they needed to make an offering to God. I don't know where they got that concept of offering to God. I'm sure probably Adam and Eve might have told them the things that God taught them. How to engage God. So they came to give to God. The scripture says that Cain came and he brought the crops of the earth and presented them to the Lord. But when you read about Abel, the Bible says that he brought the firstlings or the firstborn of his flock. There was something about his offering that he thought first about God and he brought the alpha. God had blessed him and he had increased. But he says, I'm going to take the first that came, the firstborn that came, and I'm going to offer them to God. Well, maybe God demanded a blood offering. And maybe that could have been the reason also. It wasn't stated in the scripture, so I can't go there. The Bible only says in Hebrews that by faith, by faith, he gave a better offering. Hallelujah. All right. But he gave the first fruit of his offering, or of his increase unto the Lord. And his faith caught the attention of God. In fact, it is not about the animal that he sacrificed. No. Because the Bible says that the earth is for the Lord and the fullness thereof. Everything in the earth. In fact, the, 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 the cattle on a thousand hills is for the Lord. So he's not requesting per se for you to give him a goat. No. 
But he wants to find out if you have faith enough to see him as your source, as your father, as your provider, and honor him with your substance. And immediately you play that card, God blesses you. Can I hear an amen? Let's read the scripture in Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. And this was a command that was given to the Israelites. And this principle is also even stated in the New Testament. Paul used it. Now, when, you know, they were an agrarian society, they were farmers. So when the Lord sends the rain and their harvest comes up, they were taught by the Lord that take the first fruit that comes out and present it to the Lord. Now, why would you do that? By that statement alone, you are acknowledging that God is the one who has provided the rains and has blessed the fruit of your hands so that they have increased. And by that, you are honoring the Lord. Now, after you present the first fruit unto God, what you are also telling God is that the rest are in your hands. The first fruit is not the whole thing. But you are saying that God, I've given you the first one that has come out. And I'm expecting another crop. And I know that with you in the boat, you will make sure the rest will come into fruition. Hallelujah. So Paul teaching on these same principles in Corinthians. He says, I think Corinthians 5.20. He says that Christ, our first fruit, is risen. Have you read that scripture before? Christ, our first fruit, is risen. That is to say that Christ has set us an example, or God has set us an example by raising Christ from the dead to tell us that there is a coming harvest and it will be after the similitude of Christ. There's a coming resurrection. There's a greater harvest coming. Anytime you present a first fruit unto God, all that you are telling God is that the bigger one is coming after this one. Hallelujah. Amen. And in verse number 10, 310, he says that then your bands will be filled to overflow and your vats will, and your vats will brim over with new wine when you give your first fruit. That was the mistake of that rich man in the New Testament. He planted, God gave the increase, but he failed to honor the Lord. And so, when he had the increase, all that he told himself, oh, he says, oh, my soul, live and enjoy. Because now you have a lot. In fact, the Bible says that he tore down his bands, opened it up, and he had to store. I've already told you that storing or hoarding doesn't necessarily mean that you would have more and more and more. And because he didn't honor the Lord, somehow the thought of God was not in his mind. He thought that, oh, all this I've done it by myself. That night, the Bible says, God came to you and says, you are a fool. Because your very life that sustains you is given by me. And it is I, the Lord, who blesses you. I send the rain. The olden days, they used to attribute it to Baal and to some other gods, fertility gods. No. And that was what Elijah wanted to prove to them. That the heavens will be locked until God sends us rain again. I pray that may the heavens be open over you. And may God send you rain in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The scripture I quoted was actually from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But Christ has indeed risen from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Hallelujah. So the first of God's blessing and the shadow of the blessing that is to come whenever you give the first fruit. Let me tell you a story. One day, I don't know, maybe I've told you before. My own worker, I employ him, I pay him. And um, I gave him a, a parcel of land to farm. And he planted maize. And his maize came out early. So one day I visited my place. I saw him and I called him. I said, oh, your, your maize looks good. Can you give me a few years so I can taste them? He's in a religion I wouldn't want to tell you. He says, oh, master, that is to say that, master, I beg you, 
I'm not saying I won't give you, I'll give you. But the first of this crop, I need to take it and go and give it to my pastor. They are not, I'm using the pastor just to, as a decoy. So I'm going to give to the, the, the person who oversees me spiritually. And I was like, did I hear right? So I asked him, who gave you the land? He says, oh, master, you gave it to me. And I said, who are you working for? He says, master, I'm working for you. And I said, I'm begging you. Give me small of this first one so I can eat. He says, oh, master, I'll give it to you. I'm not saying I'll not give it to you. But this first one, I'm taking it to this man who oversees me spiritually. And afterwards, I'll give you your own. In fact, I felt like crashing all his grains to the ground. But immediately I learned something. That the man understood the principle of first fruit, even though he's not a Christian. I'm not teaching that bring your first fruits to me. That's not what I'm teaching. But learn to honor God with the first fruits and the increase of your first fruits. Can I hear an amen? So I said, Abochi, won't you give it to me? He says, Master, I'll give it to you, but I'll give it to you another, another time. And truly to his word, he didn't give it to me. I thought he was joking. I thought he was just saying it. And afterwards, when he gave it out, he came back to say, Master, they made me their mouth. I can't give it to you. <laughs> Listen, learn to honor God with the things that he blesses you. Don't be wise in your own understanding. Sometimes we behave, we behave like children. You, you are eating bread and you give it to a child. And he's so happy. And then you turn around and you ask the child, can you give me? So he said, I don't give it to you. You know, children have that attitude. We play the same thing in the eyes of God. God gives us many blessings time and again. And sometimes he's just looking at our hearts and our understanding. A brother is in need. The poor is in need. We always see them and then we pass them. We don't fear God. We don't understand the principles. Sometimes the work of God, the work of God is, is going on. And God expects you to understand that you have to bring blessings into the house of God to help support the work. No, 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 no. You, you want to be coerced. You want to be forced. You want to be lied. I don't, I don't even know how to do that as a pastor. No. If you are expecting me to come here and say some wild, wild things before you give, you can get that up for me. I believe in teaching you to understand what it means to give so that out of your own volition and out of your heart, prayerfully consider it, set money aside, and give for the cause of Christ. Can I hear an Amen. Train yourself to be a giver, even with the little that you have. Charity, they say, begins at home. If you don't learn how to give when you have small, forget it. Some of you are saying, oh, pastor, you know, now my income is too small. I'm just waiting. When I have big money, I'll give. When you have big money, you can't. Learn the principle now and here. The old lady that gave that offering that day and the Lord commended her, the Bible says, out of her poverty, she had given and Jesus said that all those who had gave that day, the woman had given past everyone. Listen, you are the one that God is counting upon to finish this building. You are the one that God is counting upon to feed that orphan, that, that, that person in need. God is looking up to you to be an extension of his love to somebody. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Whenever you decide to make your first fruit, um, blessing or you want to give your offering, these are the most important ingredients you need to know. The important thing is that you do it freely with no guilt of obligation. This is supposed to be a celebration of all that God has done for you. It's a kind of worship that you can use to support the work of others. A first fruit offering is your opportunity to give above and beyond just your regular giving or titan that you give unto the Lord. You give your tithe to the Lord, that's fine. But sometimes you need to push higher. I said, I want to bless this work. There's this evangelist doing the work of God and he needs money to go. You can't go to that evangelistic field. But he says, I put down my first fruit to support that ministry. If somebody gets saved on that field, you have contributed for the salvation and God will honor you. Hallelujah. Let us learn how to use material wealth to acquire for ourselves spiritual blessings of eternal, eternal value. Can I hear an amen? 
I'll leave you with a story before I sit down. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 42, I read, A man came from Baal Shalisha. Say it after me, Baal Shalisha. All right. He says, A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread, baked from the first ripe grain. That is from the first fruits. Along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men? His servant asked. But Elisha answered, Give it to the people to eat. For this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Verse number 44. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. Can I hear an amen? This man who came from Baal Shalisha brought his first fruit. He was coming to give it to Elijah, the man of God. And when he brought it, Elijah says, no, give it to the sons of the prophets. Give it to the people who need it. But when the man looked at what he had, just 20 loaves and some wine, the guys were 100, 100 men, 100 fathers. He says, man of God, I know these loaves, it's not possible to feed them. He says, do it, give it to them. This is what the Lord says, they will eat and they will be full and there will be some left. So by faith, and that is the last thing I want to give you to you, give by faith. This man presented the loaves to the hundred people, 20 loaves. They broke the loaves, they ate. The Lord multiplied the blessing. And they had some left. That loaf was able, to, or the loaves were able to feed over a hundred people according to the word of the Lord. All that God is asking today is, what is in your hands? He asked Moses, when he got to the Red Sea, he says, what is in your hands? The rod, use it. When he met him in the burning bush experience, he says, what is in your hand? He says, it's just a rod. He says, use it, put it down. What is in your hand today? What do you have? God is asking for what you have, not what you don't have. What do you have? Remember the guy with the, the young man with the five loaves of bread? I'll put it at two over five. Two fish over five loaves. It doesn't even, it's not five over five. It's two over five. He says, this is all I have. And in fact, the apostle said it rightly. He says, God, this is all that, we, Jesus, this is all that we have. What is it to all these people? If you look at two over five, and you look at 5,000 men, hungry men, what is it to them? But God, the principle is that God is looking at your obedience and your act of faith. Can I hear an Amen. And the Bible says that, that scripture I always love, it says that, for he knew what he was about to do. We will build this house to the glory of God. For God knows what he's about to do. But he needs your act of faith, your act of obedience in the coming few weeks. And let it be regular in Jesus' name. What do you have in your hands? What do you have in your hands? That is the message I leave with you today. Whatever you have in your hands, use it. Remember that woman who went to Elijah? Says, they've come to take my children away because your, your brother, who was also a prophet, left us in debt. And the man of God asked him, what do you have at home? He says, I, I don't have anything. That is all we, we tell ourselves. You have something. He says, I don't have anything, but I, I remember I have just a small crucible of, of oil, some small bottle of oil. That is all the Lord needs from you. He's a miracle worker. Yeah. He says, that's all he needs. He says, what do you have? He says, the woman said, I don't have anything. Then she remembered. He says, I have just a small bottle of oil. He says, go and gather all that you can, the vessels, the barrels. Close your, shut yourself in, you and your son, and begin to pour. Small oil, she begins to pour. She begins to pour. She begins to pour. The drum gets full. She goes to the next one. Gets full, goes to the next one, gets full. What do you have in your hands? Don't wait till you have billions. What do you have? Out of it, prayerfully consider and be a blessing to the church of God. Be a blessing to the people of God. Be a blessing to the poor and the disadvantaged in society. And the Lord will bless you. God will richly bless you in Jesus' name. Mm. Shall we bow our heads in prayer?
I want you to pray and think through today. Thank God for his word. Next week, we'll be having our, our offering or our fundraising. Ask yourself, what am I going to give to God? And be truthful to yourself, what you can give and be a blessing to God. Begin to talk to God. Begin to talk to God. Father, we want to thank you for the great opportunity you give us every time to be givers, Lord. We are praying that you help us, oh God, to take the best of what we can and what we have and use it to bless you and to promote the work of Jesus Christ, the side of eternity. I pray that this church will be a given church, Lord, with the understanding that our blessing comes from you and from your hand. Help us, O oh God, not to be stingy, Lord, but help us, O oh God, to have a given heart, to be men and women who learn to give. Help us to give to the poor, give to the needy, give it to your church. Give for the cause of Christ, above our strength, that the things of Christ will be established. We give you all the praise. We give you all the adoration. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.